Welcome to Good News Jamaica TV. Today, you'll be introduced to Roger Stephens, the man who owns the largest collections of reggae in the world. I am talking about 30,000 flyers, 100,000 albums, and so on and so forth. He is the owner of the most Robert Nestamali items in the world. That is a serious statement. Anyway, I don't want to give you too much. Enjoy the reasoning. Mr. Stephens. Call me Roger. Hey, Roger. How you doing, man? I'm all right. Are, are you a teacher? Uh, no. 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 Unofficial. Not, Unofficial. No, I, I, I own a company called Good News Jamaica. I love it. Positive and constructive. How cool Absolutely. is that? Absolutely. <laughs> so so that's, that's the reason why we wanted to talk to you, because I mean, wow, you know, uh, but we'll get into that. How okay. are you doing, though? I'm, I'm all right. You know, my wife and I are in our late 70s and um, we take extra special caution. I understand you, you'll be dropping by tomorrow with yes, our yes. mutual friend. And, you know, we don't even let our kids in the house. And I feel terrible because you got to come all the way to the front door of the archives and I can't let you in. It, That's all right. That's all right. You can you can send me some video shots or some video or some photo shots. You, you, yeah. Photography is your thing, so anything you send me will be much appreciated. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, man. And so, you can just send it to the same email address that I sent you the thing from. Oh, okay. I'll make a point of that. Yeah. Yeah, man. So this is uh, it's not it's not an interview, and okay. it's uh, if you if you know you know our culture, so you know about reasoning. So that's okay. what this is. This is just a reasoning um, oh, between good. two people, one person that is wants to sit at the foot at the other, right? So um, I, I be the one that wants to sit at the foot. Oh. <laughs> okay, right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I've, I've been going through your biography on Wikipedia and some other sites. And um, it's, it's just, it, it intrigues me that, that the Jamaican culture was such a dragnet for you. I mean, it just, grabbed you and wouldn't let you go yeah yeah why is that well i've always been a man of words i i made my living for many years doing a one-man show called poetry for people who hate poetry oh, wow okay so i was i was a stand-up poet <laughs> okay and your dad was a stand-up comedian I absolutely yeah yeah and I, I love to make people laugh. And uh, a lot of the poems I did had a, a real humorous bent to them. Um, and, and Jamaicans just do wonderful things with the language. You know, Peter Tosh was a very dear friend of mine. Thank, thank the Lord for that one, because he, he was just a priceless once in a lifetime character. And, and what Peter did to the language was preposterous and creative and you know his manager was his damager and his <laughs> producer was his reducer right. and the judge was the grudge <laughs> and he played in Follywood, Hell A. He played in San Francisco, California, United States of Asatica because there's nothing merry about America, it's Asatica. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I was putting together that box set, um, Honorary Citizen for Peter, uh, I, I wrote a whole page of words of the herbalist verbalist. Mm -hmm. And there was one word that was revealed to me the day after the booklet went to press, because it would have been top of the line. He called the Queen of England, Queen Ear Liza Bitch. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That's Tita. Peter has always been that 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 sharp razor as he has oh, described yeah. himself to be. Stepping and sharp, yeah. The yeah. the crime minister who shit in the house of represent the thief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's priceless. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, uh, and 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 Bob, I I fell in love with Bob from the first notes of Concrete Jungle when I discovered reggae in '73. And uh, Bob could reduce the most elaborate concepts into a couplet 
and make it understandable for the masses. You know, he, he characterized capitalism, or Peter called it crapitalism. He, he said, um, uh, good God, this illiteracy is just machine to make money. That's it. True. Very That's true. all you need to know. Yeah. And I mean, Jamaicans have always been, um, been people who deal with justice, right? And just dealing with, dealing with how the world should be seen in a very simplistic way. Because we, we, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. You know, I mean, we have Jamaicans that are worthy. You know? But the majority of our culture, we don't need to talk much. We just need to know that this is right and that is wrong. Let's, and you choose a side and then we'll choose a side. And yeah, we'll man. <laughs> deal with it after that. You know what I mean? Yeah, but the, the the thing that I would love to know is how how you started your collection and what made you think that okay this is going to be a collection. When did it become a collection? Well, you know, hindsight's wonderful. Yes, I I, I never set out to do this. Okay, uh, it now fills seven rooms of our home, floor to ceiling. Oh. And when I did that huge exhibition at the Queen Mary in the year two thousand one. They took 6,000 things out of the house and framed them. And it was all too bulky to bring back to the house. Mm. So that's been in a storage space in Pasadena at the design firm for the exhibition since the end of 2001. Um, but they can't come out of the frames? Oh, yeah, but why would you want to do that? Because eventually when I get the museum that I'm hoping to build in, in Jamaica, they'll all be framed already. Why, why reframe the framed? There you go. <laughs> you know, and, and Unless, of course, you're talking them. about crime. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we're not going there right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it goes back to my, my reading an article in June of 1973 in Rolling Stone. And I've got every issue of Rolling Stone from volume one, number one, which I bought in Berkeley the day before I shipped to Vietnam and the army in November of 70, 67. And I subscribed immediately after getting to Saigon. So I've got every, every issue since then. And that'll be, that'll be in the museum because that documents how reggae crept its way into the mainstream. And that was beginning in 1973 with a gonzo journalist from Australia named Michael Thomas. And the article um, uh, traced the history of reggae. I'd never even heard the word before. And I've been into music my whole life, but I don't know how I, it escaped me. And he said, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of upper Niger consciousness. <laughs> Yeah, talk about words. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. And I said, I don't know what this is, but I've got to find this right now. I was living in Berkeley and I went out into a used book and record store on Shattuck Avenue. And I found a used copy of the original pressing of Catch a Fire that opened like a Zippo lighter for two and a quarter. Figured I could take a chance. Brought it home, dropped the needle on, on concrete jungle, and I was hooked for life. And um, the next night, <laughs> there was a little theater on the north side of campus. I don't know if you're familiar with Berkeley. Not at all. Okay. Uh, the, right off campus, there was a little 40-seat revival movie theater. And they were showing The Harder They Come. Ah. And the place was full, which wasn't hard when there were only 40 seats, but when the uh, chalice scene came on at midnight and everybody was smoking, everybody in the theater lit up uh, and, is that... <laughs> and you couldn't see the screen for all the smoke in the theater. Oh my, that has, that's a movie scene. It That's is. a movie scene. <laughs> it really, yeah. And, you know, everybody was in on it, and passing and everything else. And on the way home, I stopped at a record store and uh, bought the soundtrack to The Harder They Come. So those two albums and the movie were the one, two, three punch that just pulled me into the Jamaican frame of reference. And, I mean, if, if I look back before that, um, you know, I was madly in love with uh, Belafonte's Calypso album. But... Calypso's Trinidadian music, mm. even though Belafonte gave it a little Jamaican twist. Right. And um, 
I worked in uh, an Acme supermarket all during high school, and the only black employee we had was the uh, the the kind of uh, sweeper upper, and his name was Joe, and he was from Jamaica, and he became my best friend in the supermarket, and I just I just loved Joe and his accent and nice. his stories, and we talk about music and. But I, I, you know, I, I grew up in the suburbs of New York and I, I never knew any black people. Mm. And, uh, but I was always influenced by black culture. When I was a little kid, um, eight, nine years of age, when we were getting ready to go to mass, I'd turn the radio down to the far right of the AM dial and uh, listen to uh, Baptist church choirs on Sunday morning. Okay. And that music just thrilled me. And my parents, you know, they'd come into my room. What are you listening to? You know, come on, we got to go to church. <laughs> I said, I'm already in church, mom. <laughs> and they couldn't figure that one out at all. But I'm first generation rock and roll. I was born in 1942. So when rock started in 1954, I was primed for it. And Alan Freed, the guy who popularized rock and roll, um, used to call himself the old king of rock and roll. He was my DJ in New York, and I went to his live shows, and it was the cream of, of black musicians that I was seeing as a young teenager. Jackie Wilson doing back over flips. Wow. In the middle of that is why I love her so. She thrills me so I do a back over flip, and the mother did it. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, I, I always remember Chuck Berry doing the duck walk all across the Brooklyn Paramount stage, wow. 80 feet wide, and then just spinning around and doing it back. Wow. And Bo Diddley tripping over his uh, guitar cord and breaking his hip in the middle of the show. <laughs> and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and Fats Domino and, and uh, the cleft tones and the harp tones and the flamingos and all these early people that I used to see and whose records I collected. I was just entranced by the great harmonies of doo-wop. To this okay. day, I still love doo-wop. Then the 60s, the early 60s, after the Paola scandal took Alan Freed and a lot of the great white DJs who promoted black music, off the air, um, folk music came in, Dylan, and consciousness entered pop lyrics. And I responded to that very strongly too. But you know, you look back at the history of the music and by 1970, the lawyers and the accountants had taken over the business and the major labels bought up all the little black labels and kind of deracinated the music and disco became popular and a lot of crap and I think as a, an aging hippie in those early 70s days, uh, I and my brethren were really looking for something that would have the harmonies of the 50s and the consciousness of the 60s. And when I discovered reggae, I mean, it was all there. That was yeah, the you were primed. Was you were primed for it. I mean, once you got I introduced, was totally primed. You, you, yeah. you, you were introduced to all your ingredients that you had been looking for for 10, 15 years all yeah. up in one culture. Yeah, and, and uh, San Francisco, like Boston, was one of the few places in America that went into reggae immediately, right after The Harder They Come and, and Bob Marley. And uh, uh, there was a record store on, on Fillmore Street in San Francisco called Trenchtown Records run by my earliest teacher, Ruel Mills, who was a spar of Bob's from Trenchtown. And he didn't have much stock, uh, but he had the gatefold of Count Ossie and the mystic revelation of Rastafari. Yes. And he had Ross Michael and the Sons of Negus, and he had Slim Smith, and he had Joe Higgs, and my fave Alton Ellis, and he turned me on to so much great music and taught me about the culture. And in 1976, I had saved up $400 US cash to go to Jamaica finally and find all the records I'd been reading about in the British press and couldn't find in the States. And Mary and I went off and the week we arrived in June of 76, Michael Manley declared the national state of emergency, mobilized yeah. the army, put tanks on the crossroads and I just wanted to buy records, you know. <laughs> said, Don't go to Kingston. It, it'll be worth your life to go to Kingston. Don't go there. And and Mary and I said, but you know, we've got to go there. 
this is where all the music is. So we arrived and it was almost completely deserted. The streets were empty. Uh, and we, we got dropped off. We took a minibus from Bongo Silly's place up on in Ocho Rios. And we took a, a minibus down to Kingston. And they dropped us off in the alley behind Parade where Bob Marley had a record shack. Right. About the size of two telephone booths. And there was a, a kid working in there uh, wearing nothing but a pair of shorts. And it was about 103 degrees. And I said, well, let me see all your Bob Marley records. And he said, we don't got none. You don't have any? How about Peter? <laughs> no, we don't got none. And I got outside and I look at the sign and it says Tough Gong and Intel Diplo and <laughs> all the different subsidiary labels. And I go back in and I said, how about Bunny Whaler? And he pulls out Search for Love and Arab Oil Weapon, his first couple of singles. And all of a sudden I look down and there's a hand in my pants mm -hmm. and it's not mine. Mm -hmm. And I got $400 US in that pocket. Ooh. And I grabbed this guy so tight, I must have stopped the blood circulation in his arm because he had to let go of the money. Yeah. And he was wearing a black three-piece suit and, and the cuffs were about that far off the ground. <laughs> and he opens his jacket and he pulls out a 45 record uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> called jaja uh -huh. a hymn to the almighty the pickpocket is selling me a spiritual that's and he right. says buy my record i said that's you you wrote you're you singing this song yeah buy my record jaja <laughs> So I got off for a buck and a quarter instead of 400, but that was my, <laughs> my introduction to the world of reggae in Kingston. And then some young fellow befriended us and took me to Joe Gibbs and Randy's around the corner on parade. And then he said, you want to go to Jimmy Cliff's house? I, 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 sure. <laughs> so he hails a cab and get we get in and he says, Jimmy's place. And all of a sudden I start thinking, okay, I've been set up here. <laughs> they're going to pull into an alley and they're going to take everything we own and we'll be lucky to get out of there alive. And a couple of minutes later, we pull up on Musgrave Road in front of Jimmy Cliff's house. Nice. And Jimmy was in there with the band he was about to tour the world with, with Joe Higgs, uh, Chinnis Smith, wow. um, uh, um, Ernest Wranglin. I mean, it was a who's who of the great reggae stars of that time. And they just opened their arms and welcomed us in. We spent three hours there. He, he found out I was a Vietnam veteran. He wanted to know all about the war. And, and we became friends from that point forward. And we always recall that whenever we see each other. So uh, we had the, the worst and the best within minutes of our arrival in Kingston. Within minutes, and that is interesting. What what tried to stop you from coming in, which was the army and the tanks and the such, became your catalyst to actually what you're sitting in now. Well, I was in Saigon in the Tet Offensive. No martial law is going to scare me. Yeah, but your wife wasn't. No, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, She's a ballsy chick, man. I... <laughs> Excellent. It's always good to have one of those. <laughs> no kidding. Nowadays, they'd call her a ride or die chick. So... Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> we, we met on an acid trip in a pygmy forest in Mendocino under a total eclipse of the moon, and we've been together since that day 45 years ago. Yeah, I can see how that could be, be the catalyst of that. Yeah. <laughs> good, good trip, man. <laughs> I brought a couple of treasures up to show you. Okay. This is, uh, the stamp collectors call this a cover, a cached cover. And this is postmarked at the UN on the day that Haile Selassie made the war speech to wow. the UN. Wow. wow. And it is autographed by Haile Selassie. Oh, oh my god. And his signature confirmed by his secretary in the Imperial Palace. I gotta get, I gotta get my this. My goodness.
Thank you for checking us out on Good News Jamaica TV for content that informs, inspires, and transforms. Please like, share, leave a comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more positive Jamaica content. Walk good, 